Principle 55. Be a class act. In every society, there are human benchmarks, certain individuals whose behavior becomes a model for everyone else, shining examples that others admire and emulate. We call these individuals class acts. Dan Sullivan, co-founder and president of The Strategic Coach, Incorporated. I've already mentioned my friend and colleague Dan Sullivan, the creator of The Strategic Coach Program. One of the groups he coaches is for high achievers earning over $1 million a year. Though I routinely earn many times that, I still seek out coaches of Dan's caliber to help me fine-tune my success skills. So I joined Dan's coaching group in Chicago. While I was in the program, Dan taught me a success principle that works for so many of the super achievers I've met and studied that I'm surprised I didn't recognize it earlier as an important discipline we should all come to master. Simply stated, it's be a class act. That's it. Strive to become the kind of person who acts with class, who becomes known as a class act, and who attracts other people with class to his or her sphere of influence. The sad truth in society today is that there don't seem to be as many class acts around as there used to be. I think everyone would agree that actors Jimmy Stewart and Paul Newman were class acts. Tom Hanks is a class act. Kate Middleton, Duchess of Cambridge, and Maria Shriver are class acts. So are Denzel Washington and Garth Brooks. Coretta Scott King and former president of South Africa Nelson Mandela were both class acts. Herb Kelleher, the former CEO of Southwest Airlines, is a class act. But how can you differentiate yourself as a class act in a world where most people are unconscious and unspecial? The answer is that you have to continuously work at it. Strive to free yourself from the many fears and anxieties that diminish the imagination and ambition of most people. Instead, operate outside the world of conventionality in your own world of expansion, creativity, and accomplishment. I'd like to suggest Dan Sullivan's model of class act behavior as a guide to up-leveling your own thinking and behavior. This is adapted from the work of Dan Sullivan, the founder of The Strategic Coach. I strongly encourage you to check out his coaching program, his books, and CDs. You can learn more at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Live by your own highest standards. Class acts liberate themselves by establishing personal standards of thinking and behavior that are more demanding and exacting than those of conventional society. These standards are consciously chosen, established, and applied. Maintain dignity and grace under pressure. You can do this three ways. 1. Remain imperturbable in the face of chaos. 2. Maintain a calmness that gives courage. Your calmness gives others hope that things will turn out all right. 3. Develop and express the quality of certainty. The greatest 20th century example of this characteristic of a class act was Winston Churchill, who in World War II almost single-handedly saved Western civilization from the defeat at the hands of Nazi Germany. By his ability to stay calm and provide confident and courageous leadership, that focus the resolve of both the British and the Americans. Focus and improve the behavior of others. Because a class act individual is a good role model, other people around them begin thinking and acting at a level that surprises both themselves and others. Someone who best exemplifies this third characteristic of a class act is Larry Bird the great all-star, Hall of Fame basketball player who played on three championship teams with the Boston Celtics. To a person, the other players on those teams have said they were able to play at such a high level only because of Larry Bird's example and leadership. Operate from a larger, inclusive perspective. Because class acts are in touch with their own humanity, they have a deeper understanding and compassion for the humanity of others. They feel inextricably linked to others, are compassionate about human failures, and are courteous in the midst of conflict. 
increase the quality of every experience. Class Act individuals have the ability to transform seemingly insignificant situations into something enjoyable, meaningful, and memorable because of their conscious thinking and actions. They are creators rather than merely consumers and they constantly enrich the lives of others by introducing greater beauty, significance, uniqueness, and stimulation into every experience. How you are treated at a Ritz-Carlton or a Four Seasons Hotel is a good example of this characteristic. Counteract meanness, pettiness, and vulgarity. The hallmarks of this characteristic are courtesy, respect, appreciation, gratitude, and generosity of spirit. One of my favorite examples of this characteristic of a class act is Pat Riley, the former coach of the Los Angeles Lakers and the New York Knicks, and current president of the Miami Heat. What makes him a class act, in my mind, is his grace in the face of loss off the court. When Pat was coaching the Miami Heat in the NBA playoffs against the New York Knicks, he invited the entire opposing team and its coach to his home for a barbecue and personally spoke to each player, congratulating all for a great season and wishing them the best. Though Pat could have been competitive and aggressive, he acted instead in a way that elevated and acknowledged others. That's a class act. Take responsibility for actions and results. Class act individuals are accountable when others hide. They tell the truth about their failures, and they transform defeats into progress. Strengthen the integrity of all situations. Class Act individuals are always establishing and achieving larger goals that require them to constantly grow and develop. They're always adding increasing value to the world, too. Expand the meaning of being human. Class Act individuals approach everyone, including themselves, uniquely and as a result constantly find new ways to make life better for themselves and others. In pushing boundaries for themselves, they do the same for others by giving them new freedom to express their uniqueness at home, at work, and in the world. Increase the confidence and capabilities of others. Class acts are energy creators, rather than energy drainers. Class acts build confidence in themselves by consciously choosing their governing ideals, and by creating structures that support the fulfillment of their aspirations and capabilities. These new structures also support others by creating safe and stimulating environments that encourage greater creativity, cooperation, progress, and growth. In giving me the above list, Dan taught me a lot about what it truly means to be a class act. But more important, he taught me the benefits of being recognized as a class act by others. How to become known as a class act When people mentioned the great former UCLA basketball coach John Wooden, who won 10 NCAA championships in a 12-year period, they agree that he was a class act. Wooden became known as a class act because, frankly, he acted like one. He took time to acknowledge others and he conducted himself with an eye toward improving and expanding the world. He communicated to people, You're special. You count. One of the hardest parts of any coach's job is making the final cut, deciding who makes the team and who doesn't. Most coaches just post a list of who made the team on a bulletin board in the gym. You either made it or you didn't. But showing his deep respect and love for all people, Wooden did it differently. Instead of simply posting a list of names on the wall, Coach Wooden sat down with each player, one at a time, and told them what other sports at UCLA he felt they could be successful at. He shared what he saw as their strengths, discussed their weaknesses, and, on the basis of their strengths, identified what they could do to improve their athletic careers. He took the time to acknowledge their strengths and boost their self-esteem leaving prospective athletes motivated and encouraged rather than feeling emotionally devastated. When you choose to live by a higher set of standards, you get to watch people respond enthusiastically toward you. Soon you'll notice the effect that it evokes. Wow! 
That's someone I want to be friends with, be in business with, and be connected with. Why being a class act helps you succeed. In fact, that's one of the major benefits of being a class act. People want to do business with you or become involved in your sphere of influence. They perceive you as successful and someone who can expand their possibilities. They trust you to act with responsibility, integrity, and aplomb. Perhaps that's why the easiest way to spot class acts is by looking at the people class acts attract. Look at the people they do business with, the people they socialize with. Class acts tend to attract people who are at the top of their game. Have you taken a good look lately at your friends, your colleagues, your partners, clients, and contacts? Are they class acts? If not, consider that disparity as a mirror reflecting your status back to you. Make the decision now to recreate yourself as a class act and see what kind of people you start attracting. Do fewer things, but do them better. Raise the quality of your attitude and change your behaviors for the better. At my office, for example, when we noticed we were using disposable paper cups, we switched to using glassware, improving the quality of our office environment and sending a message to our staff, clients, and guests that we think highly of them. Similarly, my wife and I used to throw several parties a year that frankly weren't all that great. Now we throw one or two big parties every year, but we create it as an event that nobody can forget. People enjoy gourmet food in an elegant setting with an array of interesting and important guests and entertainment. Everyone feels privileged, esteemed, nurtured, and loved. This is not to say that we never have pizza and beer out by the pool with our closest friends and family, but when it comes to business and our larger social network, we continually strive to be class acts. In the last several years, we have started conducting four-day high-end luxury retreats, limited to 24 people who want to take their lives, their careers, and their business to the next level. We hold them in private villas and five-star hotels and exotic vacation destinations like Maui, Bali, Dubai, Florence, and occasionally at my estate in Santa Barbara. We serve fine wines and gourmet food prepared by world-class chefs, and we greet people the first night with special gifts. We take people on excursions like sunset cruises in Maui, cocktail receptions at private beach clubs in Santa Barbara and wine tasting or dining out at the top restaurants in Florence and Dubai. In addition to providing a breakthrough training experience, we do everything we can to make the retreat an extraordinary personal experience as well. Class acts teach others to treat them with esteem. Of course, the first person you should treat with dignity, respect, and esteem is yourself. My friend Martin Root is a class act. He always dresses well, eats well, and conducts himself at all times with refinement and style. In addition, he treats everyone around him with love, dignity, and respect. Consequently, and by example, he's taught everyone around him to also treat him well, simply because he treats himself and others with such thoughtfulness and care. If you're sloppy, always late, and don't care how you conduct yourself, you're going to be met with people who treat you in a sloppy, always-late, don't-care manner. When I know Martin's coming to visit, my first reaction is to make sure we have a good bottle of wine, some fresh fish, some simple but exceptional vegetables, and fresh raspberries for dessert, because that's how Martin has trained me to treat him. If a head of state, the Pope, or the Dalai Lama were coming to visit your home, wouldn't you have the house cleaners in there for a week? Wouldn't you buy the best food? Well, why don't you do that for yourself? You're just as important as they are. The bottom line is that certain people command a certain level of respect, not only because of how they treat others, but more important because of how they treat themselves. When you establish a higher level of personal standards, not only do you get better treatment from those around you, but suddenly you also begin attracting others with the same elevated standards. You get invited to places where those standards exist. You get to enjoy the activities that people in the upper echelons enjoy. All by becoming a class act. 
Part 5. Success and Money There is a science of getting rich, and it is an exact science, like algebra or arithmetic. There are certain laws which govern the process of acquiring riches, and once these laws are learned and obeyed by anyone, that person will get rich with mathematical certainty. Wallace D. Waddles, author of The Science of Getting Rich Principle 56. Develop a Positive Money Consciousness There is a secret psychology to money. Most people don't know about it. That's why most people never become financially successful. A lack of money is not the problem. It is merely a symptom of what's going on inside you. T. Harv Ecker, multimillionaire and author of Secrets of the Millionaire Mind like everything else I've discussed in this book, financial success also starts in the mind. You have to first decide what you want. Next, you have to believe it's possible that you deserve it. Then you must focus on it by thinking about it and visualizing it as if it were already yours. And finally, you have to be willing to pay the price to get it, with disciplined effort, perseverance over time. But most people never get to even the first stages of accumulating wealth. Too often they are limited by their own beliefs about money and by the question of whether or not they deserve it. Identify your limiting beliefs about money. To become wealthy, you need to surface, identify, root out, and replace any negative or limiting beliefs you may have about money. Though it may seem odd that anyone would have a negative predisposition toward wealth, we often have limiting beliefs buried deep in our subconscious that we picked up in our childhood. Perhaps when you were young, you heard phrases like, Money doesn't grow on trees. There's not enough money to go around. It's selfish to want a lot of money. You have to have money to make money. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You have to work hard to get money. Money is the root of all evil. People with money are evil, selfish, and unethical. Rich people are greedy and dishonest. You can't buy happiness. The more money you have, the more problems you have. If you're rich, you can't be spiritual. These messages from early childhood can actually sabotage and dilute your later financial success because they subconsciously emit a vibration that can cancel out your conscious intentions. What did your parents, grandparents, teachers, religious leaders, friends, and co-workers teach you about money as you were growing up and as a young adult? My father taught me that rich people get rich by exploiting the working class. He constantly told me he wasn't made of money, that money didn't grow on trees, and that money was hard to come by. One Christmas, my father decided to sell Christmas trees. He rented an empty lot worked hard every night from Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve, and just broke even after a month of hard labor. As a family, we were left with the belief that no matter how hard you work, you never get ahead. Wealth brings pain and misery. There are many other limiting decisions you can make about money that can keep you from making or enjoying the amount of money you deserve or want. For example... Anne was in her mid-thirties when she attended one of my seminars in Australia. She had inherited a lot of money, but she hated it. She was ashamed of her wealth, hid it, and wouldn't spend it. When the subject of money came up in the seminar, she began screaming about how money had destroyed her family. Her father, who had made a lot of money, was never home. He was either out working hard to make money or out jet-setting around the world spending it. As a result, her mother drank excessively, causing constant fighting and screaming in their household. Not surprisingly, Anne's childhood had been a miserable experience. But instead of identifying her father's greed and workaholism as the actual cause of her pain, Anne had decided as a child that money was the culprit. Because childhood decisions made during times of intense emotional upset tend to stay with us longer, and actually grow stronger over time. Anne had retained her negative beliefs around money for more than twenty years. It's not okay to make more money than my father. 
Scott Schilling, the director of corporate training for ID Life in Dallas, Texas, was attending one of my seminars where we were working on identifying and releasing limiting beliefs. When I took the participants through a deep process to discover a limiting belief that might be keeping them stuck financially, Scott remembered the day he was 18 and had just finished his first month as a life insurance agent, earning a commission check of $1,856. His father, who was in the 46th year with the same insurance company and only one month away from retirement, received his own paycheck that day for $1,360. Scott said, When I showed my check to my father, he never said a word, but the look on his face told me he was deeply hurt. I thought, how could I do that to my dad? How could I make such a great and noble man question himself and his value? Scott had made a subconscious decision that day not to earn more money than his father. In order to avoid causing his father the shame and embarrassment Scott imagined he felt that day 25 years earlier. But less than a month after releasing this decision in my seminar, Scott told me he received a contract to do a week's worth of sales training for a fee equal to one-fifth of his previous year's total salary. Since then, Scott has gone on to become the national sales director for several companies, generating nearly $25 million in sales from the platform for one of them, and developing a training program for another one that grew their sales from $8 million to $100 million in five and a half years. Becoming rich would violate the family code. I grew up in a working-class family. My father was a florist, and he worked for the rich. Somehow the rich were not to be trusted. They stepped on the little people. They took advantage of the common worker. To become rich would have meant becoming a traitor to my family and my class. I didn't want to become one of the bad guys. If I become wealthy, I will be a burden. Tom Boyer is a business consultant who felt like he had hit a plateau in terms of his income. With some brilliant assistance from my friend and trainer, Gay Hendricks, he discovered a childhood decision had put a cap on his success. Tom grew up in a middle-class family in Ohio. While they never wanted for food or basic necessities, his father made lots of financial sacrifices so that Tom could pursue his dream of playing the clarinet. While he started out playing on his dad's old metal clarinet, Tom soon graduated to a LeBlanc, a very middle-of-the-road wooden instrument. When he began to really excel, his clarinet teacher, Mrs. Zielinski, went to Tom's parents and said, Your son has real talent. He deserves a very, very fine instrument. He deserves a buffet clarinet. In 1964, a buffet cost $300 which is about $1,500 today. And though that was a lot of money to Tom's family, nevertheless it was agreed that Mrs. Zielinski would pick out the clarinet that was to be Tom's Christmas present. On Christmas morning, Tom went downstairs, unwrapped the package, opened the case, and discovered the beautiful clarinet with its polished grenadilla wood body and bright shiny silver keys sitting in its regal blue velvet case. It was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. But when Tom turned to thank his parents, he didn't even get the thank you out of his mouth before his mom said, We never would have been able to afford that if your sister had lived. Tom's sister Carol had suddenly died of encephalitis when he was seven years old. In that moment, Tom took on the subconscious belief that the greater a success he became, the greater a burden he would be to those who love him not only financially, but emotionally. With Gay Hendricks's help, Tom realized that this subconscious belief had held him back from attaining the level of success he consciously wanted. He had convicted himself of the crime of being a burden, and was now punishing himself by not allowing himself the level of success he truly deserved. The present state of your bank account is nothing more than the physical manifestation of your previous thinking. If you sincerely wish to improve your results in the physical world, you must change your thoughts, and you must change them immediately. Bob Proctor, author of The Power to Have It All, and a featured teacher in the movie The Secret.
Three steps to turn around your limiting beliefs about money. You can change your childhood programming by using a simple yet powerful three-step technique that replaces your limiting beliefs with more positive and empowering ones. While this exercise can be done on your own, it's usually more powerful and definitely more fun to do it with a partner or a small group of people. 1. Write down your limiting belief. Money is the root of all evil. 2. Challenge, make fun of, and argue with the limiting belief. You can do this by brainstorming a list of new beliefs that challenge the old ones. The more outrageous and fun you make them, the more powerful the resulting shift in your consciousness will be. Money is the root of all philanthropy. Money is the root of great vacations. Money might be the root of evil for someone who is evil, but I am a loving, generous, compassionate, and kind person who will always use money to create good in the world. You can even write out your new money beliefs on 3x5 index cards and add them to your stack of affirmations to be read out loud with enthusiasm and passion every day. This daily discipline will go a long way toward helping you manifest success in the area of money. 3. Create a Positive Turnaround Statement Create a new statement that is the opposite of the original belief. You want this turnaround statement to be one that sends shivers of delight through your body when you say it. Once you have it, walk around the room for a few moments, repeating the new statement out loud with energy and passion. Repeat this new belief several times a day for a minimum of 30 days, and it will be yours forever. Try one like, When it comes to me, money is the root of love, joy, and good works. Remember, ideas about financial success never form by themselves. You have to keep thinking the thoughts that build the thought form of prosperity. You have to take time each day and focus on thoughts of prosperity and images of financial success. When you intentionally focus on these thoughts and images, they will eventually crowd out the limiting thoughts and images and begin to dominate your thinking. If you want to accelerate reaching your financial goals, you need to practice saying positive money affirmations every day. Here are a few more that I have used with great success. God is my infinite supply, and large sums of money come to me quickly and easily for the highest good of all concerned. I now have more money than I need to do everything I want to do. Money comes to me in many unforeseen ways. I am making positive choices about what to do with my money. Every day my income increases whether I am working, playing, or sleeping. All my investments are profitable. People love to pay me money for what I most love to do. Remember, you can plant any idea into the subconscious mind by repetition of thought infused with positive expectancy and the intensely felt emotion associated with already having it. Use the power of releasing to accelerate your millionaire mindset. Whenever you are doing your money affirmations, or any affirmation for that matter, it is not uncommon to become aware of competing thoughts, objections, such as, Who are you kidding? You're never going to be rich. How many times do I have to tell you? You have to have money to make money. When this occurs, First, write down the competing thought and any negative feelings it creates. Then you can close your eyes and release the thought and any negative emotions that accompany it using the Sedona Method, or tapping therapy. The Sedona Method is a simple technique for releasing that's taught by Hale Dwoskin. I am a big fan of this methodology, and I teach it in my workshops. I also recommend you take a Sedona Method class. Purchase the Sedona Method Home Study audio program and watch the movie Letting Go, or read Hale's book, The Sedona Method. We've put a complete tutorial to the Sedona Method's basic releasing questions at the Success Principles website, www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Scroll down to Principle 56 and click on the link. Visualize what you want as if you already have it. 
Remember to also include money in your daily visualizations. Seeing all your financial goals is already accomplished. See images that affirm your desired level of income, such as paychecks, rent checks, royalty checks, dividend statements, and people handing you cash. See images of your ideal bank statements, stock reports, and real estate portfolios. See images of the things you would be able to buy, do, contribute to if you had already met all of your financial goals. Make sure to add the kinesthetic and olfactory dimensions to your visualization. Feel the smooth texture of the world's finest silk against your skin. Feel the relaxation of a luxurious massage in the world's finest spas. And smell the fragrance of your favorite cut flowers filling your home, or the delicate scent of your favorite imported perfume. Next, add in the auditory dimension, such as the sound of the surf on the beach in front of your vacation home, or the gentle hum of the finely tuned engine of your new Porsche. Finally, remember to add in the feeling of appreciation and gratitude you would feel if you already had these things. This feeling of abundance is part of what will actually attract more abundance to you. This is a critical part of the process that people often leave out. Constantly fill your mind with images of what you want and picture yourself already having them. Make sure you also include your words and images of your financial goals on your vision board. See pages 130 to 131. Another technique I've found helpful in visualizing a wealthy lifestyle is taught by Esther and Jerry Hicks in their book, Ask and It is Given. Find a beautiful box and put a label on it that reads, Whatever is contained in this box is. Then begin clipping pictures, ads, and other images of those things you want to bring into your life. Place each clipping in the box and feel the feeling of owning it, using it, and enjoying it. Principle 57. You get what you focus on. If you don't put a value on money and seek wealth, you most probably won't receive it. You must seek wealth for it to seek you. If no burning desire for wealth arises within you, no wealth will arise around you. Having definiteness of purpose for acquiring wealth is essential for its acquisition. Dr. John Demartini, self-made multimillionaire and consultant on financial and life mastery, author of The Breakthrough Experience and Riches Within. It's been said that in life you get what you focus on. This rule applies to getting a new job, building a business, winning an award, but most especially to acquiring money, wealth, and a rich lifestyle. You must decide to be wealthy. One of the first requirements of becoming wealthy is to make a conscious decision to do so. When I was in graduate school, I made the decision to become wealthy. Though I didn't quite know at the time what that meant, being wealthy seemed as if it would provide many of the things I wanted in life, the ability to travel to attend any workshops I wanted, to buy the books I wanted, to support the causes I cared about, and to have all the resources I needed to accomplish my goals and underwrite my hobbies. I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, wherever I wanted, for as long as I wanted. If you want wealth too, you must decide now from the deepest place in your heart to have wealth in your life, without yet worrying about how or if it's possible or not. Next, decide what wealthy means to you. Do you know how much wealth you want? Some of my friends want to retire as millionaires, whereas others want to retire with $30 million or even $100 million. Two friends want to become mega-rich because of the philanthropic ability it would give them. There is no right financial goal to have, but you do have to decide what you want. If you haven't yet determined your vision from Principle 3, Decide What You Want, including defining what your financial goals are, take time to do so now. Make sure to include written goals like these. I will have a net worth of blank dollars by the year blank. I will earn at least blank dollars by December 31st next year. I will save and invest blank dollars every month. 
A new financial habit I will develop starting now is blank. To become debt-free, I will blank. I will be debt-free by blank. Find out what it costs to finance your dream life, now and later. When creating wealth in your life, remember that there is the life you want to live now and the life you want to live in the future. The life you are currently living is the result of the thoughts you have thought, the choices you have made, and the actions you have taken in the past. The life you live in the future will be the result of today's thoughts, choices, and actions. To get the kind of life you want one to two years from now, as well as the kind of lifestyle you want when you retire, you need to calculate and decide exactly how much money you'll need to live the lifestyle of your dreams. If you don't know, research how much it would cost you to do and buy everything you want over the course of the next year. This could include rent or mortgage, food, clothes, medical care, automobiles, utilities, education, vacations, recreation, insurance, savings, investments, and philanthropy. For each category, visualize those items or activities in your life. Then write down what you would need to spend to get them. Imagine eating in fine restaurants, driving your dream car, going on your dream vacation, even refurbishing your home or moving into a new one. Don't let your mind tell you that these things are impossible or crazy. For the moment, just do the research and find out exactly what it will cost to fund your dream life, whatever that is. Get real about your retirement. Determine, too, how much you'll need to maintain your current or upgraded lifestyle once you retire and stop working. Though I don't ever plan to stop working, if retirement is in your plans, Charles Schwab suggests that for every $1,000 in monthly income you'll want during retirement, you'll need to have $230,000 invested when you stop working. If you have $1 million invested with a 6% yield, that will give you a taxable income of about $4,300 a month. Whether that's enough will depend on a number of factors, such as whether your house is paid for, how many people you'll be supporting, how much you will be receiving from Social Security, and what level of lifestyle you expect to live. At any rate, today, $4,300 a month may not be enough to support the abundant lifestyle you may be envisioning for yourself. If you are hoping to travel, to have an active life, it may not even be adequate. With inflation, it may be less than adequate. Become mindful about your money. Most people are unconscious when it comes to their money. For instance, do you know your net worth, your total assets minus your total liabilities? Do you know how much money you have in savings? Do you know exactly what your fixed and variable monthly expenses are? Do you know the total amount of debt you are carrying and the amount of money you are spending a year on interest payments? Do you know if you are adequately insured? Do you have a financial plan? Do you have an estate plan? Do you have a will? Is it up to date? If you want to be financially successful, you have to become conscious. Not only do you have to know precisely where you are, but you also need to know exactly where you want to go and what's required to get you there. Step 1. Determine your net worth. If you don't know your net worth, you can 1. Work with an accountant or a financial planner to calculate it. 2. Use one of the many free techniques on the Internet. 3. Purchase some software, such as Personal Financial Statement, which is available at www.myfinancialstatement.com. Step 2. Determine what you need to retire. Next, calculate what your financial needs will be when and if you retire. Be aware that retirement, by its very nature, requires that you be financially independent. A good financial planner can tell you how much in savings and investments would be required to produce enough in interest, dividend, rental, and royalty income to live your current or future lifestyle without having to work. Financial independence frees you up to pursue your passions, travel, engage in philanthropic endeavors and service projects, or do whatever you wish. 
Step 3. Become aware of what you're spending. The number one problem in today's generation and economy is the lack of financial literacy. Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Most people aren't aware of what they really spend in a month. If you've never tracked your expenditures, start by writing down all your normal fixed monthly expenses, such as your mortgage or rent, your car payment, any other installment or loan payments, insurance bills, cable bill, internet provider, health club, and so on. Then go back over the last 6 to 12 months and calculate average monthly expenditures that fluctuate. Utilities, phone bills, food bills, clothing expenditures, auto maintenance, medical expenditures, and so on. Finally, keep a record for one month of everything you spend money on during that month, no matter how big or small, from gas for your car to coffee at Starbucks. Add up everything at the end of the month so that you are consciously aware, rather than unaware, of what you're spending. Check off those items you must pay for and those things you have discretion over. This exercise will make you aware of what you're currently spending and where you could cut back if you choose to. Step 4. Become Financially Literate We were not taught financial literacy in school. It takes a lot of work and time to change your thinking and to become financially literate. Robert Kiyosaki, co-author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and creator of The Cash Flow Game. Not only should you stay conscious around money by reviewing your financial goals every day and tracking your spending every month, but I recommend that you also proactively learn about money and investing by reading at least one good financial book every month for the next year. I recommend you read two really good resources written by my friend Phil Town. Rule number one, the simple strategy for successful investing in only 15 minutes a week. And payback time. Making big money is the best revenge. For additional resources, go to the Suggested Reading and Additional Resources for Success section at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Another way to become financially literate is to seek out professionals who can teach you the money skills you'll need to grow a healthy financial future. You can invest your money in stocks and bonds, which pay you in dividends and interest. Or you can invest in income-producing real estate, which pays you in positive cash flow from rental income that is greater than your mortgage payments. Like most baby boomers in their mid-fifties, Mark and Sheila Robbins were locked into their employee mindset. They didn't talk about creating a life of wealth and abundance. They just worked hard. Sheila for 35 years as a flight attendant for United Airlines, and Mark as a manager of a car dealership, and put money in their 401k accounts. After losing about half of their retirement funds in a declining stock market, they decided there had to be a better way. That's when they joined a financial services organization and started taking the courses they offered. As a result of reading the Rich Dad, Poor Dad books and playing the cash flow game, their conversations began to include the language of money, and their minds embraced the idea of becoming real estate investors. They sought out a realtor who specialized in the types of properties they were interested in, and over the summer they went shopping. Only one short year later, they had 15 single-family rental properties worth over $2 million, all of which were generating positive cash flow. If that weren't enough, they also now own their own successful Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership and another home-based business. Because they were willing to take the time and money to invest in their financial education and implement the principles they learned, their lives have dramatically changed and will never be the same again. Principle 58. Pay yourself first. You have a divine right to abundance, and if you are anything less than a millionaire, you haven't had your fair share. Stuart Wilde, author of The Trick to Money is Having Some. In 1926, George Klassen wrote a book called The Richest Man in Babylon, one of the great success classics of all time. 
It is the fabled story of a man named Arkad, a simple scribe who convinces his client, a moneylender, to teach him the secrets of money. The first principle the moneylender teaches Arkad is, a part of all you earn must be yours to keep. He goes on to explain that by first putting aside at least 10% of his earnings and making that money inaccessible for expenses, Arkad would see this amount build over time and in turn start earning money on its own. Over an even longer time, it would grow into a lot because of the power of compound interest. Many people have built their fortunes by paying themselves first. It's as true and effective today as it was in 1926. A Telling Story As easy as this 10% formula is, I'm always shocked at how unwilling people are to hear it. Not too long ago, I was taking a limo from the airport back to my home in Santa Barbara. The 28-year-old limo driver, after realizing who I was, asked me to share with him some principles of success he could apply to his own life. When I told him he should invest 10% of every dollar he earned, and then keep reinvesting the dividends, I could tell the information was falling on deaf ears. He was looking for a get-rich-quick scheme. But though opportunities that can earn you money faster are always something to look for, I believe your future must initially be built on the solid bedrock of a long-term investment plan. The earlier you start, the more quickly you can build your safety net of a million dollars. Sit down with a financial planner, or go to one of the myriad sites on the Internet where you can enter the amount of your current net worth and your financial goals for retirement and then calculate how much you need to save and invest from this point forward to achieve your goal amount by the time you retire. The Eighth Wonder of the World Compound interest is the eighth natural wonder of the world, and the most powerful thing I have ever encountered. Albert Einstein, winner, Nobel Prize for Physics If you are new to the idea of compound interest, here's how it works. If you invest $1,000 at a 10% rate of interest, you'll earn $100 in interest and at the end of your first year have a total investment of $1,100. If you leave both your original investment and the earned interest in the account, the next year you'll earn 10% interest on $1,100, which is $110. The third year you'll earn 10% on $1,210, and so on for as long as you leave it there. At this rate, your money would actually double every seven years. That's how it eventually turns into a huge amount over time. Of course, the best news is, time is your friend when it comes to compound interest. The sooner you start, the greater the result. Consider the following example. Mary starts investing at age 25 and stops when she reaches 35. Tom doesn't start investing until the age of 35, but keeps investing until he retires at 65. Both Mary and Tom invest $150 per month with a rate of return of 8% per year compounding interest. But look at the surprising result when they both retire at age 65. Mary invested only $18,000 over 10 years and ended up with $283,385 whereas Tom contributes $54,000 over 30 years and ends up with only $220,233. The person who contributed for only 10 years has more than the person who invested for 30 years but started later. The sooner you start saving, the longer you have for compounding interest to work its powerful magic. Make saving and investing a priority. The world's most aggressive savers make investing money as central a part of their money management as they do paying their mortgage. To get in the habit of saving some money every month, immediately take a predetermined percentage of your paycheck and put it in a savings account that you don't allow yourself to touch. Keep building that account until you've saved enough to move it into a mutual fund or bond account or to invest it in real estate, including the purchase of your own home. The amount of money that is wasted paying rent without building any equity in a home is a tragedy for many people. Investing just 10% or 15% of your income will help you eventually amass a fortune. Pay yourself first, then live on what is left. 
This will do two things. One, it will force you to start building your fortune. And two, if you still want to buy more or do more, it'll force you to find ways to earn more money to afford it. Never dip into your savings to fund your bigger lifestyle. You want your investments to grow to the point that you could live off the interest if necessary. Only then will you be truly financially independent. He paid himself first. Dr. John Martini is a chiropractor who now conducts seminars for other chiropractors on how to grow themselves personally and their practices financially. He is one of the wealthiest and most abundant people I know in spirit, friends, and adventure, as well as in money. John told me, When I first got into practice years ago, I paid everyone first and took whatever was left over. I didn't know any better. Then I noticed that people who had only been working for me less than six months were all getting paid on time. I realized that their pay was fixed and mine was variable. That was kind of crazy. The most important person, me, was the one under the stress, while the others had all the stability. I decided to turn that around and pay myself first. I paid my taxes second, my lifestyle budget third, and my bills fourth. I arranged for automatic withdrawals, and they've completely changed my financial situation. I don't waver. If bills pile up and money doesn't come in, I don't stop the withdrawals. My staff is forced to find a way to book more seminars and collect more money. Under the old system, if they didn't book or collect, it was on my back. But now it's the other way around. If they want to get paid, they figure out ways to make more money. The 50-50 Law Another rule John suggests is that you never spend more than you save. John puts 50% of every dollar he earns into savings. If he wants to increase his personal expenditures by $45,000, he first has to earn an additional $90,000. Let's say you want to buy a car for $40,000. If you can't put an extra $40,000 into savings, you don't buy the car. Either buy a cheaper car, make do with what you have right now, or go out and make more money. The key is that you don't raise your lifestyle until you've earned the right to raise it by putting the same amount into savings. If you do raise your savings by $40,000, you know you've earned the right to raise your lifestyle by that same amount. The 50-50 law will get you rich very quickly. It was the core of billionaire Sir John Mark's Templeton strategy for building wealth. Don't tell me you can't do it. Most people wait to start saving until they have some extra money lying around, a comfortable surplus, but it doesn't work like that. You have to start saving and investing for the future now. And the more you invest, the sooner you will reach financial independence. Sir John Marks Templeton, mutual fund pioneer and philanthropist, started out working for $150 a week as a stockbroker. He and his wife, Judith Folk, decided to invest 50% of their income in the stock market, while still making tithing a priority. That left the two of them only 40% of his income to live on. But by his death in 2008, John Templeton was a billionaire. He kept the practice up his whole life, and later in life gave away $10 for every dollar he spent to individuals and organizations that supported spiritual growth. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? According to government figures, in 1980 there were 1.5 million millionaires in the United States. By 2000, there were 7 million. By 2014, there were 9.6 million. The number is expected to grow to approximately 20 million by the year 2020, with 65 million worldwide. It has been estimated that someone in America becomes a millionaire every 12 minutes. With a little planning, self-discipline, and effort, one of these millionaires can be you. Millionaire doesn't mean celebrity. Although you might think, judging from Donald Trump, Brad Pitt, and Oprah Winfrey, that most millionaires are celebrities. The truth is more than 99% of millionaires are hard-working, methodical savers and investors. These folks typically make their fortune in one of three ways, from entrepreneurship, which accounts for 75% of all the millionaires in the United States, as an executive at a major corporation, about 10% of millionaires, 
or as a professional practitioner, doctor, lawyer, dentist, certified public accountant, architect. Additionally, about 5% become millionaires through sales and sales consulting. Indeed, most U.S. millionaires are regular folks who worked hard, lived within their budgets, saved 10% to 20% of all their income, and invested it back into their business, real estate, and the stock market. They are the people who own the dry cleaning business, the car dealership, the restaurant chain, the bread company, the jewelry store, the cattle ranch, the trucking company, and the plumbing supply store. However, people from any walk of life can become millionaires if they learn the discipline of saving and investing and start early enough. You've no doubt heard of Osceola McCarty of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, who had to drop out of school in the sixth grade to take care of her family. She eventually spent some 75 years of her life washing and ironing other people's clothes, lived a frugal lifestyle, and saved what she could from the little money she made. In 1995, she donated $150,000, the bulk of her 250000 life savings, to the University of Southern Mississippi to provide scholarships for needy students. And here's the interesting part. Had Osceola invested her savings, which is estimated to have been about $50,000 in 1965, in an S&P 500 index fund, which had earned an average 10.5% a year, her money would have grown to not $250,000, but $999,628, virtually a million dollars, four times as much. How to Become an Automatic Millionaire The simplest way to implement the Pay Yourself First plan is to have a plan that's totally automatic, that is, set up so a percentage of your paycheck is automatically deducted and invested as you direct. Financial planners will tell you from their extensive experience with hundreds of clients that very few, if any, follow through with a plan to pay themselves first, if it's not automatic. If you're an employee, check with your company to see if they have self-directed retirement accounts such as 401k plans. You can arrange for the company to automatically deduct your contribution to the plan from your paycheck. If it's deducted before you receive your check, you'll never miss it. More important, you won't have to think about your investments. You won't have to exercise self-discipline. It doesn't depend on your mood swings, household emergencies, or anything else. You make the commitment once, and it's done. Another advantage of these kinds of plans is that they are free of most taxes until you withdraw the money. So instead of having 70 cents working for you, you have an entire dollar working for you, compounding year after year. Some companies will even match a portion of your contribution. If you work for such a company, get on board now. Check with the employee benefits office of your company and find out how to sign up. When you do, make sure to make the largest percentage contribution you are allowed by law but at least 10%. If you absolutely cannot bring yourself to do 10%, then do the largest percentage you can. After a few months, reassess and then see if you can't increase it. Get creative about where you can cut costs and how you can increase your income through other sources. If you don't have a company retirement plan, you can open an individual retirement account, IRA, at a bank or a brokerage firm. With an IRA, you make a financial contribution of up to $5,500 a year, $6,500 if you're 50 or older. Ask the bank, the brokerage firm, or a financial advisor to help you decide if you want a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. The paperwork to start an IRA takes about the same amount of time as opening a checking account. And to keep it automatic, you can arrange for an automatic deduction from your checking account. For a much more detailed explanation of how to benefit from an automatic investment program, I strongly recommend that you read The Automatic Millionaire, A Powerful One-Step Plan to Live and Finish Rich by David Bach. For those of you older than 40, read David's Start Late, Finish Rich. David has done a superb job of providing you with everything you need to know, as well as a host of resources for putting these recommendations into action even including phone numbers and websites, so you can do all of this from the comfort of your own home. Build assets rather than liabilities. 
Rule 1. You must know the difference between an asset and a liability, and buy assets. Poor and middle class acquire liabilities, but they think they are assets. An asset is something that puts money in my pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of my pocket. Robert T. Kiyosaki, co-author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and creator of The Cash Flow Game. Far too many people run their financial lives by their expenditures and whims. For most people, their investment model looks like this. Your income goes 100% into your expenses and liabilities, and zero dollars goes into your assets. But take a look at how wealthy people approach their investments. They take the money they earn and invest a large portion of it in income-producing assets, real estate, small businesses, stocks, bonds, gold, and so on. If you want to become wealthy, follow their lead. Start approaching your financial activities like this. Your income. 80% of this goes into your expenses and liabilities. 20% of this goes into your assets and multiple streams of income. And 100% of that goes to build more assets and multiple streams of income. Eventually, you can live off the income from your assets and your multiple streams of income. That's true financial freedom. Once your nest egg starts to grow. As your money begins to grow, you'll want to educate yourself further about the best way to invest your money. Eventually, you'll probably want to find a good financial advisor. The way I found mine was to ask successful friends who they used, then listen for the same name to come up more than once or twice. That's exactly what happened. It's best to go with a certified financial planner, a CFP, which is an instant signal of credibility, but not necessarily a guarantee. To start, ask people like you if they can recommend a planner. If possible, you want to find a planner with successful experience advising clients in the same stage of life as you. If you don't have friends who are using a financial advisor, or you don't get anyone that several people agree on, a good place to go is the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors at www.napfa.org. These planners are fee-only, which means their only revenue comes from their clients. They accept no commissions at all and pledge to act in their clients' best interests at all times. A planner who earns money based on commission rather than a flat hourly rate could have an incentive to steer you in a particular direction. In many respects, NAPFA standards meet or surpass the requirements needed for a CFP credential. One final word about building an investment portfolio. Be sure to protect it with appropriate insurance, including professional liability insurance if you are self-employed, and a prenuptial agreement that acknowledges the financial resources you're bringing to the marriage. <laughs>